Lucas, it's so so last. So thank you so much for joining us, Mary. It's absolutely lovely to see you. How how's the last uh, year been? I know you had a really busy year running the London Marathon, amongst other things. Oh, I know, crazy. Um, yes, I just I think since um, backing down from top level eventing, I still have this sort of urge to do all these different you know have goals in my life sort of thing rather than having goals of trying to get an Olympic gold medal and win badminton again um sort of you know veering on to other things and yeah so it's been you know really good fun preparing for the marathon and then running in the London marathon and um yeah I'm not a natural runner but it all went pretty smoothly yeah oh I'm sure I, I'm not a natural runner and I've never done a marathon but I've, I've trained for several half marathons and always got injured but I think when you've got legs that are used to riding they are just like pistons and I think if you do the training and don't get injured I think you can just kind of keep keep going can't you because I, I know when I'm doing fitness stuff yeah my legs are just, just like a machine my legs just kind of keep going but yeah very very impressive and how nice actually to have a bit more space and time in your life Horses just take up everything, don't they, to be able to do other things. So, yeah, how yeah. exciting. Yeah. Right, well, Mary, we've got a few more people joining us. And as I said, everyone else will be catching us up on the replay. I don't really think you need much introduction, but we'll give a little introduction. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Mary King, I'm sure most people are. Mary is a household name in the UK, without a doubt. And I imagine worldwide as well. Very successful event rider represented the UK at six Olympics, correct me if I'm wrong, it's six, isn't it? It is, yes. Many, many um, World Christian Games, all the top level events, and is very kindly joining us as a special conference guest to talk about some of your biggest takeaways from your long and successful eventing career. And oh, it's really, really lovely to see Mary. So thank you so much for joining us. So much you could talk about, so much to share. You can hear my voice is a bit croaky. So I'm going to ask Mary a couple of questions and I'm going to let her do the talking, which is ideal. Please, please, please put any questions if you're joining us live in the chat and I will relay those to Mary. So Mary, I'm going to start off by asking you, what is your biggest takeaway from all these years? What's probably your, your number one takeaway? Um, now, uh, there are just so many, that's quite a, it was difficult to think of one when you asked, you know, when I saw what questions you were going to ask me. Um, I think really the main one is to enjoy those good times, you know, and be, um, it's so easy to get, um, you know, so involved in what you're doing with the horses and to be, um, you know, there's such huge highs and lows, as we all know, who own horses and ride them and, and maybe compete them, highs and lows. And it's really when things are going well, just make the most of it and enjoy it. And if you do have a win, a big win or whatever, or small win, you know, just enjoy it because <laughs> things are going to go wrong again in the future. And, you know, you've got to be able to cope with those down times. So, um, you know, make sure you enjoy when the times are up. <laughs> now, that's such good advice. And I think that's applicable at every level because you just, nobody knows what's around the corner, do they? From even just your horse losing a shoe to something much more dramatic. You just can't always guarantee that you'll have that same lovely hack or competition or whatever or training session, you know, tomorrow or next week. So yeah, that's that's such helpful advice. Well, Mary, I'm gonna share some of the pictures you very kindly sent over because I know that's one of the things you wanted to talk us through. So let me find the right place on our slides. Here we go. So Mary's very kindly sent, we're going to call them the before and after photos, Mary, weren't we? That's what we were calling them earlier. And you're going to talk us through these pictures, what they represent to you. And we've got some other ones to follow later. So yeah, start us off. What's happening in this picture? <laughs> yes, well, I chose this picture because there's so many things I can see that I'm doing wrong in this picture. It was obviously when I was way younger and I was, I was very competitive and um, you know they're typically typical mistakes I'm making that most riders do make when they're learning to ride across country. Um, so number one is look at that lower leg. 
that lower leg is swung back, the heels up, the toes out a bit. Um, I'm really actually very insecure in the saddle with the lower leg in that position. If by any chance with, um, you know, the, the horse had um, hit the fence or if he happens to land and peck on landing, I'm going to fall off so easily. Um, so as we'll see with the later pictures, are we able to sort of flick on to a later one? Yeah, just, just to show the obvious difference to my lower leg position it's there. Very clear difference. Yeah. <laughs> and there. And you see with this position, your lower, my lower legs, in, if anything, slightly forward, sort of on the girth, slightly forward. Um, I'm so much more secure. If, if that horse had, um, you know, if it made a mistake on the approach and he had ended up, you say, would run a bit deep to the fence and he'd caught his, um, you know, caught his front leg, say, on the front of the fence, I would be very secure there with my lower leg forward. And I always say to people, it's a bit like your anchor. Um, if you can keep your heel down, toe up, lower leg forward, you actually won't fall off unless your horse falls over. It's if you let your lower leg swing back, that's when you become very sort of um, looser and more vulnerable to toppling off if things go wrong. So, but you know, I didn't know, you know, when I was young, I didn't know that that was a thing you were meant to do. I was um, very, um, very competitive. And um, oops, I have something funny coming up on my screen. There we are. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, I've got another funny something coming up on my screen. Oh, all looking okay, Aaron. So hopefully right. that's, uh, that's nothing to worry about. Okay, I'll uh, just knock myself. Sorry, I'm doing something about Adobe Flash Player who's doing something now. Um, how do I get rid of that then, I wonder? Can you minimise it? I'm not sure what's popped up. Oh, I yeah. had this, uh, the other day I was presenting some training and some emails and suddenly popped into the middle. It's always the way, isn't it? Exactly. Host, uh, if, if I go on to that, oops. So secure leg is so important. And I've got to ask, when we flick back to this old picture, do you think white girths will make a comeback? Is that a prediction for 2022? <laughs> Oh, I know. Right. I <laughs> White can't... girls were highly prized. I can remember that from, from my uh, young horsey days. Yeah. They were, yeah, White girls were very, very popular and very on vague. Yeah. So you're just talking about... That was the string girl, because I yes. can't see the pictures now, but I'm happy to, if you can see me. Oh, yeah, we can see yeah. you and we can see the pictures. Oh, yeah. sorry, you can't see the pictures. So um, yes, string. string girls were very yeah. popular, weren't they? They were, and funnily enough, I noticed, I was looking at um, Ingrid Klimke, the amazing German event rider, and obviously her father, <coughs> Rainer Klimke, was sort of an absolute god in the dressage world. He's, you know, the uh, renowned as being, having been the top dressage rider and trainer of all time. Anyway, Ingrid, his daughter, who obviously is very successful, she wears string girths. And I oh, maybe they'll, they'll be coming there. back. Well, actually, Mary, we've got a question on tack. Um, just come in which talking about girths you must have seen so many changes over the years from string girths to smart girths all and everything in between do you think there's been a great improvement in welfare in this respect or maybe sometimes to the detriment you've had so many different things come in and out of fashion or have you just always sort of stuck to your favorites and maybe more of the basics and yeah what are your thoughts yeah, some things I've stuck to the basics, but I have, um, you know, there's a lot of um, tack and equipment um, is made now that's so much more comfortable for the horses thinking. I mean, like girths, how now, you know, you'll, you'll have much wider girths. I remember I used to, uh, when this, I stopped using string girths, I went to, and felt I ought to use leather girths. I used to use something called a balding girth. Oh, I remember those, yes. Yeah. And really, they were very good, strong girths, but they were narrow. And yeah. it must have been so much more, so uncomfortable for the horse compared to the wider, softer girths that you get these days. So there's things like that. Um, saddles are much, so much better fitting and more quality and com more comfortable for the rider and the horse. Um, and then obviously things like rugs, gosh, how they've come on in the, the old days when we used to use the old jute rugs that were 
pull back on their shoulders and you know easily rub their hair off and their heavy weight New Zealand rugs and now I mean I'm sponsored by Bucus and their rugs are awesome and they do every weight of every sort and that you know it's just makes oh, it must be so much nicer with the horses <laughs> yeah definitely <clears throat> I think it's easy to get like swept up in the latest thing isn't it when it comes to tacking equipment and as you said many improvements have been very much for the better but I think particularly as a um, you know sort of low-level amateur rider it's easy to feel like you've got to have the latest of everything but as you said sometimes maybe you don't need it all and sticking to the basics can be quite helpful and um, I'd love to, yeah. to talk us through what your horse in, this, in the old pictures wearing on its legs compared <laughs> to what a horse would be wearing on its legs nowadays. Um, no, I can't, can't see the picture. Have I got bandages on? Or? You you look like you have got um, Gamgee or Fibre G bandages and you have definitely got some insulating tape over the top of the bandages, which I do remember from, from my early pony club days as that was definitely the thing to do. Yes. Um, but I'm you know, going through water, that must have soaked up everything. Yes, and really how little protection, the proper protection that gives the horse. I mean, maybe a bit of support if you, you know, done it correctly. Um, but yeah, leg wear for horses again has come on enormously, but there is so many different types of boots on the market. Um, but, you know, the way that you can have, you know, what I look for is lightweight boots um, with for cross country, the hard um, back down the uh, back of the front boot so that there's no risk of that, the dreaded injury where the horse strikes into themselves. Mm. Um, and now also I use hind boots with the hard part down the front of the hind boot so the horse is going to be protected if he does knock a fence with a hind leg and also a boot that's cut lower, a flap lower over the front of the hind fetlock because again that is the most vulnerable part of the horse's hind leg. Um, but you know lightweight is so important especially if you're doing bigger longer cross-country courses. Um, you know the, the lighter you can have the horse, uh, you know the horse's legs um, the, the better it is for them less chance of injury. Yeah definitely I mean it must have been like carrying around you know some wet, wet towels around their legs I think in, in that those pictures and yes I think the the newer pictures that you sent me yes very very different leg wear well that's so interesting and um, another question that we had is how you felt some of your older horses your horses from kind of back in the days the ones that probably some of us had posters of you on our walls with how do you think they would have coped with venting now because the sport has changed massively it's very, very different, isn't it? So how do you think some of your old superstars would have fared if you were able to bring them back? So, yes, um, I think, I mean, in a vet there, each one would have coped in a different way. I mean, thinking of the real name, something like King William, you know, he was, um, he was fantastic on the flat um, and a great cross-country horse. I mean, he, his forte also was his stamina, how he would go around, you know, in the olden days, how he did all the roads and tracks and steeplechase. You know, he used to gallop. The steeplechase was five minutes of galloping, roads and tracks. I mean, in all, you over an hour of trotting. And then you went around a great big 13-minute cross-country course. You know, it's so different from these days where now you just was around a 10-minute cross-country course or possibly 11 minutes at the most. Um, so anyway, um, but how he would cope these days, I think he would have still been very competitive. I mean, the dressage has come on in leaps and bounds as well. The, you know, if you watch the tests now compared to the olden days, they are, you know, so much better. But King William was fantastic on the flat. He did some very top tests. So I think he would have held his own there. He would have been fantastic across country although his strengths wouldn't be tested as in the stamina but I think you know his show jumping was his weak point and I'm you know possibly that's that still would have been especially as now the jumping courses are a bit bigger than they used to be and more technical so um that's him a horse like star appeal if some of you remember him and yeah. um, the horse that I um, he won Babbins and Amberley on consecutive years. He was he was a very good three-day event horse, really. He was 
again, a horse that could gallop and keep going for, you know, minutes and minutes and minutes and finish galloping around Babington and feel like he would go around it again. Now, his dressage wasn't so good. He was very obedient, but he wasn't a very flashy mover. So he would have been quite down after the dressage these days, however hard and he would have tried to have done well and he just wouldn't have had the elegance that's needed these days to do a good test but he would have um been would have been great in the other two phases he was a clean jumping horse jumped lots of clear rounds so I think that that would have been fine so yeah they're, they're all sort of different in how they would have coped but yeah I mean it has changed I mean, from when I very first started eventing you know, I remember I had my first proper event horse was a horse called Humphrey. And I was, as in that photograph you saw, I was very competitive and used to go much too fast. And But I knew if I went fast enough, clear and got as few a time penalties as possible, even though I'd done a poor dressage test and maybe had a show jump down or two, I'd be able to do really well if not win it so I used to just go much too fast so, <laughs> foot yeah. down was <laughs> foot down was the policy to to get yeah, a win absolutely. and how things have changed yeah. I assume you didn't get um potential points if you were going too fast back <laughs> when you started no exactly and I think the times were more difficult to get <laughs> people didn't get the time across country um around the major events so it really was the quickest you could do very well and you know I went through a phase of getting flat out and having some great wins and then I had a tremendous fall and suddenly started to dawn on me that it wasn't all about going fast there's, there's technicality involved here ah that was my next question was what prompted the the huge change in leg position was it connected to the fall was it needing some security <laughs> yes I mean um yeah both but also it was training um when I first got sort of noticed by the selectors I was asked to go to, if I wanted to go to a training day which I couldn't believe and yes off I went and there was a lady called Pat Manning who was a fantastic cross-country trainer um back in the day in the day and she was horrified at my learning I had no idea that you were meant to keep your leg forward and <laughs> she picked me up on it and you know made a really big thing of it that I must must learn to jump with my lower leg forward and that lesson did me so much good you know and and then you know other things in that picture um while we're sort of talking about the lower leg also upper body too far forward reins too short and going too fast you know you need to you know those were sort of four things in that picture I can pick up on straight away that were incorrect and you know the way to ride well and safely across country is to be in a slightly more defensive position keeping your upper body you know you're still going with the horse and forward over the fences but not too forward and being a bit defensive um in a more, a more slightly more upright position and as is the case if you watch compare old videos of event riders and videos now these days and watch people like Mickey, Michael Young and top riders, look how much more upright they are than in the olden days when we were all forward. So um, yes, so that and also riding with longer reins to give the horse more freedom and for you to be able to be more sort of flexible, you know, to, with, with your um, hands. Um, whereas if you've got short reins, you're not flexible. If a horse jumps down the drop, you know, and you're holding your reins short, you're going to get dragged forward. Yeah, definitely. Well, it sounds like that was an incredibly impactful session for the rest of your career. How fantastic. Now, you mentioned some of the, the big name horses, as you called them. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. It's probably really hard to answer. And it's probably like asking if you've got a favourite child. But Mm -hmm. Have you got a favourite horse from all of these years? You must have had some incredible horses. Yeah, um, some really of them good. who've been household names and, and maybe some who haven't, who've still made a massive impact on you. So yeah, could mm -hmm. you narrow it down to a favourite one or maybe two? Well, I think the, the one that I owe the most to that really helped make me was the horse way back called King Boris. 
Now he was one of the first horses, well, it was my second horse I rode at, to the top level that I rode at Badminton. And um, he was such a forgiving horse. He was more a sort of three quarter bred type. He was slightly sort of stronger and a little bit heavier his body, but he had such a big heart. And he put up with me making bad mistakes, going too fast, doing you know bad turns or lines to fences. And he had that sort of nature that he always wanted to try and jump that jump ahead and didn't get offended when I made mistakes. Whereas, you know, and that's what with younger riders or riders, you know, more amateur riders wanting to ride at a higher level, that's it's so important to have not a sort of sensitive, sharp horse that won't cope with your mistakes because you'll make them, you know, you were sort of, you know, you hope you're not going to make a mistake, but I mean, you do. And, you know, it's part of learning. So I think he was a huge part of my career. And I think if I'd had a more sensitive horse that, you know, it ended up running out or stopping when I had made mistakes, I it can easily then put you off, you know, and you're then doing yeah. it and then that makes you not want to do it. And that's sort of end of that. So oh, I that's, so, that's such a nice story. That's lovely. So yes, a forgiving horse can, can really help catapult you forward. That's lovely. On a similar note, I'd love to ask if you could bring back one of these past horses, is there something you do differently, you know, knowing what you know now, if you could, you know, have one of these horses back again, do you sometimes think, oh, if only I'd done X, Y, Z, because hindsight's great as now, I think we all can think that about any aspect of our lives. So mm. is there a horse that you could bring back and is there something you do differently? Which horse would that might that be and what would you do differently? Um, well, I think, um, something like King William, I think I could do a, you know, do a much better job with his show jumping than I did when I, you know, had him in that part of my career. You know, I, that was my weak phase as a rider and being his weak phase as well. I think that's why we had so, you know, quite a few mistakes. Um, I don't think, you know, even if, you know, I was rating, you know, really well now, I think he, you know, he wouldn't be an easy horse in the show jumping phase, but I'm sure I could have done it and do a much better job now. Um, oh, fantastic. So, yeah, I think that's the one that really sticks in my mind is I could have helped more. <laughs> that's so true, actually. When the, when the rider has a weakness in one area, if the horse is also weak in that area, that, that's quite challenging, isn't it? But I'm I always sure say, you... sorry to interrupt, I always say to people when they're choosing horses, you know, be really honest with yourself as to, your strengths and weaknesses and try to aim to to buy a horse that suits you you know it's um so that you know it can help you in the phases that you're weaker in that's so true and it, it's buy for the horse that you're capable of riding not for the horse you think you should be riding i'm i'm sure mary you've seen many people buy what on paper is the perfect horse but maybe isn't the perfect horse for them and mm -hmm. Yeah. That doesn't always pan out too well, does it? <laughs> Definitely not. Another question I'd love to ask is, I mean, obviously we've got the conference coming on Saturday, we'll be looking at the you know, latest research developments. Research in the last 20, 30 years has been huge. And I think that you know, the most recent Olympics, so much useful research was, was um, done before those Olympics. And some of these principles, you know, sort of scientific principles for fitting, cooling horses, was able to be applied. Um, I wondered if there was anything that we know now that perhaps you would have found useful, you know, back in, in the days that you were competing at that level. Well, the most obvious thing that, um, that I think of is when you, you know, in, in the olden days, um, when you finished the cross country, you would soon, you know, you might sort of wash your horse down in a big way but you know now we know so much better how to wash horses down correctly to get their their core temperature down and be you know very very generous with the water and scrape it off as soon as you you put it on it's warmed up sweat scrape the, the warm water off and apply more cold water you know I think you know we used to just sort of wash the horse down and then put a rug on it thinking you know that was the right thing to do not to let it cool down too quickly um, whereas now it's, you know, very much proven that, you know, to keep, um, you know, don't put rugs on horses that are hot, you know, they must be allowed to cool down as quickly as possible. 
um, and to use, as I say, plenty of water, plenty of, um, of scraping down, especially in, in the hot weather. And also thinking about it, letting them drink. We used to, I remember, you know, I think in the pony club, it used to be a thing that you weren't, mustn't, uh, you know, offer horses water straight away after they've been galloping, you must wait for an hour or something. <laughs> Whereas now, you know, we offer water right up until the horse will go across country. And also as soon as he's finished and his bridle comes off immediately, offer them water, let them hydrate um, as quickly as they can. And that will help their re recovery. Do you think you see better recovery rates in, in doing some of these practices? Because yes, as you said, horses must have been a bit hot and quite dehydrated <laughs> with mm. the best of intentions. You know, we only knew what we knew then. Do you but, think horses recover better these days? Yes, I'm sure. And also, I think it helps them feel much better than, than the following day and day after if they're looked after very well at the end of the cross country course, um, they'll be much fresher from you having um, cooled them quickly. Um, yes, got their core temperature down, um, offered them water so they, you know, don't, um, don't have any chance of dehydration. All those things will help us recover much quicker and feel much better the following day. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, it's so, so interesting. So I said, we've just learned so much and it's really interesting to just see how welfare has, has potentially improved as well. But I love in all these pictures, how happy your horses look. They clearly, and you as well, you're always, you're always smiling, Mary. I think you're well known for being such a smiley person. <laughs> but your horses all look, any picture I've ever seen, they always look like they're having a great time and that they are so happy to do their job. Yeah. And I think that is so, so important. I've seen photographs of not looking too happy. When oh, <laughs> I must have seen a good selection then. But I think on the whole, your horses do always seem to look like they really like their job. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure you've had horses that perhaps aren't suited. to. It's, it's quite a tough job being an event horse. I'm sure you've had some that just um, would not cut out for it over the years. That's right. You buy, you know, I would buy a young horse that I feel is going to be a, a top horse in the future. But, you know, there are horses that literally they don't enjoy it. And, you know, they, they might do it because you have trained them and, and they, they're doing as they're told. Um, but they, you can feel that they, their enthusiasm for it isn't there. And they're the horses that, you know, they would get up to a level and then they would start to make mistakes because they're not really wanting to do it. And that's where I think any rider, you know, you need to be very, again, strict with yourself as the trainer and owner. You know, if your horse isn't happy, if you're competitive yourself and you're finding that the horse is not enjoying what it's doing, much better to cut your losses, sell your horse to somebody who's less competitive and not wanting to ride at the high level that you yourself want to do. So that, you know, the horse then can really enjoy his life. He's not being pressed and put under pressure of a level of competition that he doesn't want to do. But saying that, you don't want to then, as soon as your horse start, has to stop, think, oh, doesn't want to do it. I guess, uh, you know, it's not, you know, you need to be able to weigh up, you know, is it, being a bit naughty is it looking for you know um it's stretching the boundaries trying to see what it can get away with or you know that sort of thing so um yeah you know it's all about a balance for yeah. sure but I think it's we've got so much better at listening to horses um where I I think many people are finally starting to listen they've always been talking to us but just I think mm. a lot of people have missed what they've been saying one question for you, Mary, was which course has been your favourite to ride and why? That's a great question. <laughs> oh, and I've been very lucky and ridden around some most amazing cross-country courses around the world in, you know, over the years. But still, my favourite is badminton. Oh, I um, felt sure you were going to say badminton. <laughs> <laughs> Although a lot of riders will say Burley. You know, Burley is, it used to be years ago, you know, Badminton was the biggest and the best. Burley was slightly smaller than Badminton. And so quite often riders would do Badminton one autumn first with their sort of horse that's coming up to the top level and then go to Badminton the following spring. Whereas now it's not like that. Burley is as big as Badminton and got very um, difficult terrain. Badminton's more sort of level, whereas Burley has more ups and downs so it depends on the horses you have 
Um, but still, yes, yeah, something, if I was able to win one more major event in my life, I would definitely choose badminton as the one. <laughs> Do you have any plans for a Mark Todd style <laughs> comeback then? <laughs> well, I still have this ridiculous urge to compete at the top level. Um, but I know that, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. So, you know, I'm 60 this year. And I'm still really quite good in my body. I'm, you know, although I've broken many things um, over the years, I'm still pretty sort of fit and supple and that sort of thing, which you do see some older riders that are quite stiff in their shoulders or, you know, got real sort of problems. And I keep, you know, part of me thinks, come on, Mary, quit while you're still um, well. But still part of me would love to, um, compete at the top level but I'm very happy producing the young horses the ones I've bred and sort of buy young horses a little bit and produce them I mean I wonder if ever I happen to breed again or have a horse that is exceptional you know I, I wonder still whether I will go on and ride at, at a high level but I know I shouldn't <laughs> I have a feeling we shouldn't rule it out today. That's really my gut instinct. <laughs> well, we'll watch this space. Mary, I've got one final question for you, for you before we part company this evening. It's been so lovely to see you. Thank you so much for your time. All right. so what is your secret? Like you're so motivated, you're still so passionate and you know, not everybody lasts as long. It, it, a really hard sport. You've had so, you look like you've had so much fun over the years I'm sure you have you've had such a successful career yeah what's what is your secret what's your secret sauce yes I don't know I think it's just um in me I've got this you know had this competitive um instincts and um yeah just have always wanted to do it can you hear me still? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's gone completely blank now, my screen. Oh, I took this, the, I took the pictures off. Oh, we sorry. can see you, we can see you just fine. Oh, sorry, Mary's talking to herself to a blank screen. We can see you fine. <laughs> don't worry. Um, so, um, yes, and I think, I don't know, um, you know, yes, I've say, been going on and on eventing for years. Yes, it's hard, you know, it is hard to give up It's if it's, you know, this sort of, you've got this inner drive. Um, but in the in the olden days, it used to for women, especially once you got sort of to the age where you had the children, and that seemed to be the end of your eventing career. But I broke the mould and had children and <laughs> carried on, and it didn't seem to affect my um, you know drive at all. Um, and then I think I don't know. I, I sort of wonder whether I've never had a lot of horses which I'm always been happier, or that might sound a lot to, um, you know, to, to more sort of amateur riders, but I've, you know, never wanted more than eight horses to compete in my yard. You know, whereas most top riders, they have, you know, sort of 18 to 20 horses. And if you're Oliver Townend or Andrew Nicholson in his heyday, you know, they're right, they've got about 50 horses they're competing with and they're out every you know weekend every Saturday Sunday midweek riding the maximum of five horses at every event they go to and you know I've never wanted that and I think because maybe I've done less horses and managed to make my business work in that way that's kept me um, you know more motivated and and also we're having a break at the end of the season I've always been one to stop I'm quite happy when the season comes to the end say in October and the horses get turned away and I quite like just not riding for you know I play with the young horses a little bit but the, I used to completely in a way sort of shut up the yard the, the horses went out in the field the girls who worked for me were happy you know it was all arranged that they would go off and do something else for a couple of months and you know I might have to play with the young horses a bit myself on my own but then we'd all start again in January, the horses would come back in, the girls would start work, and it was all so exciting to get going again. Whereas, you know, some riders will continue working hard all through the winter, you know, and I can imagine that would easily make you 
sort of want to stop quicker than maybe the way I, I managed to do. Yeah, I think yeah. so holidays, it sounds like holidays and time off is the, yeah, yeah. holidays are the key to Mary King's success. <laughs> what a great piece of advice for everyone to take away. And Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely lovely to see you. And I will catch up with you very soon. And as I said, I will certainly not rule out seeing you at Babington in a couple of years time because I just have a feeling <laughs> you yeah. could be back at that level again. But who knows? Who knows? We'll see. Oh, lovely to see you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Take care, Mary. Bye. Okay. Bye everyone.